Attention. It is so important to the state of Israel that people in the U.S. only hear one story. A campaign to um, promote the image that Israel is a safe haven for gay and lesbian people and a great anti-homophobic place. Israel is not a gay-friendly country. Israel is gay-friendly when it serves its purposes. Propaganda for Israel to cover over its brutal brutal apartheid regime. This just one of 160 airstrikes by the Israeli military on Gaza overnight and into this morning. The hospitals here filling up rapidly with casualties, most of them civilians, according to Palestinian health officials. I feel like it, in my mind, is like a distraction technique to be like, look over here, look over here, don't look over here, and all the other things that we're doing that are really horrible, and all the people we're killing, but look over here and think about rich gay people and how they want to come visit us and how great we are. With a gay scene that competes with all gay capitals around the globe, an amazing beach, good weather, great food, and other attractions in the country like Jerusalem and the Dead Sea, Tel Aviv is definitely a place you should go and check out for your next trip. There is no magic pink door in the apartheid wall. We may be queer. I can show up at, an, uh, at Ben Gurion airport and say I'm lesbian, let me in. They're not going to do that because I'm Palestinian. So when you say gay friendly, which gay person are you talking about? There was going to be like an orchestrated tour, totally funded by the Israeli consulate, and the city of Seattle was going to be hosting an event where a delegation would be able to speak about gay rights in Israel. Probably they have no idea that this is part of a propaganda campaign, that it's funded by the government of Israel, that it's, you know, part of this much larger project that really has very little to do with LGBT people or fighting homophobia or transphobia, and a lot more to do with defending colonialism and apartheid. You saw that recognition dawn around the table on the commissioner's faces of what did we get ourselves into? They voted to cancel an official event that was supposed to happen the next day. Like, business as usual got disrupted. The city council in Seattle was at an uproar. I don't think they had any idea what was coming. I actually first heard about um, the presence of an Israeli delegate at a queer youth center in Tacoma. And because I do queer youth work, that is kind of what rung out to me first. I didn't realize it was part of a tour. I just learned that queer youth specifically are going to connect with others through the Israeli consulate, which was so kind of jarring to me. And then after that, I learned that it was actually part of a larger tour that was going to hit Olympia, Tacoma, and Seattle. And we knew that since it was sponsored by the Israeli consulate and Stand With Us, that it was a pinkwashing tour. I know Stand With Us. It's never been a gay-friendly organization. It's never been involved in gay rights. It had never done anything for queers anywhere. And suddenly it's jumping on that bad bandwagon. Why? They're a deeply homophobic organization, and they have no problem allying themselves with organizations like QFI, Christians United for Israel, and the, the executive director, John Hagee, who has said things like, Katrina happened because of gay people. So I know you're very uh, opposed to homosexuality, but you think that the, the whole city was, was punished because of things like the forthcoming gay pride parade. This is true. Uh, all of the city was punished because of the sin that happened there in that city. There's lots of record of him and Roz Rothstein, the national um, executive director for Stand With Us, being on close terms and sp her speaking publicly at Christians United for Israel. I returned from my trip to Palestine in January 2012, and only maybe six weeks later or something, I found out this pinkwashing delegation was coming through, right? This delegation of LGBT activists from Israel who were coming to share how great um, LGBT politics is in Israel. And the other influence really made it And I'd just come back from Palestine where I'd been witnessing genocidal apartheid regime, um, where I'd been meeting with families whose children had been killed by 
having a gas canister, you know, shot their heads. I was overwhelmed with how important it was to make sure, especially that the organizations I knew well, that they knew what this was. Basically, there is a campaign on the part of Israel called Brand Israel, which is a campaign to project Israel as a culturally vibrant, hip, modern, cool country. actually come up with this campaign, Brand Israel, in direct response to the fact that thanks to decades of education on the part of people who realize that Israel actually is not the amazingly wonderful democratic country that it is, it is a settler colonial state founded on the genocide of the Palestinian people and it maintains its power through a system of apartheid and discrimination against the Palestinian people. So that truth is actually coming out. In 2005, 170 civil society organizations came together and issued this call based on the South African call for a global solidarity movement in the form of boycott, saying, if you want to support the Palestinian people, this is the strategy that we would like you to, to engage in. Boycott Israeli goods divest from companies that profit from the Israeli occupation and call for sanctions on Israel until it abides by international law. And so in response to Israel's tarnished image, Israel has come up with this campaign, Brand Israel, which is very actively trying to fix Israel's image. <laughs> Part of that rebranding, Israel is, is, is putting money and resources towards what, what activists that I'm involved with call a pinkwashing campaign, which is a campaign to um, promote the image that Israel is a safe haven for gay and lesbian people and a great anti-homophobic place. So it's done that by funding films that um, promote those ideas and sending them to film festivals. Um, in the United States, it funds panels of um, gay and lesbian rights activists and leaders to go around the United States and give talks about how forward-thinking Israel is, how innovative Israel is on gay and lesbian rights issues. There's certain things I've noticed that help me spot the propaganda, right? So one obvious thing is that it might be funded directly by the government through the consulate or another source. Are there particular images used that kind of promote an idea that Israel is a safe haven or a mecca? One example I often see is a rainbow flagged Israeli flag, or these two flags kind of coming together and overlapping, that there might not be words listed, but I know what the image is trying to tell me. Pinkwashing also, it has a number of tropes, but sort of, they're very recycled. Once you start to see the films and speakers across the board, they're kind of saying the same thing every time. So that's also one way we can discern what is it about. So things that they will say are, Israel is the only safe place for gay people in the Middle East, right? There's often the terrible use of the term Mecca to say it's a gay Mecca. There's a, often a glamorous painting of the Tel Aviv nightlife as a sort of like gay tourism destination that would be a wonderful place to visit, just be careful of the scary homophobic Arabs outside of Israel's borders. The point of this is not to protect LGBT people, right? Like, in reality, there's immense homophobia in Israel and the United States. I mean, I, I don't know of a country that doesn't have serious problems with homophobia and transphobia. But the point of this is propaganda for Israel to cover over 
its brutal, brutal apartheid regime. There are four commissions that are staffed out of the Office for Civil Rights, and one of them is the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender Commission. And commissions serve in an advisory role. And so any issues that pertain to the LGBT community, the commission is there to provide advice to the mayor and city council and department directors. The Seattle LGBT Commission was going to be hosting an event where a delegation would be able to speak about gay rights and Israel and their progressivism. I was concerned because a lot of local organizations, some of which I care about or have a connection to, were going to do these events and probably they're just thinking, oh cool, we get to do an event with international speakers, we don't have to pay anyone to fly, like this is a great opportunity to learn something. So I wrote an open letter to the LGBT Commission of Seattle. I felt like I really wanted them to know what they were getting into. The commission publicly posted a response to my letter. The Seattle LGBT Commission values the comments of Dean Spade, who recently brought to our attention the concerns of the Israeli and Palestinian conflict and agenda of pinkwashing to cover up said crimes and corruption of the Israeli government. While we believe his concerns are valid, the purpose of the meeting with Israeli LGBT groups is to engage in a dialogue about their successes and the progress of LGBTQ people's rights in Israel and Seattle. If ever we were going to get the event actually canceled, which of course is the high level goal whenever you're trying to interrupt an event that you think is, you know, politically damaging because it's going to tell a lie, you know, you want to actually not have that happen. And so we were like, okay, I was like, we got to go. This is our chance. Let's get a group together. Let's make it happen. It felt really right that we go and that we, you know, on public record because this was an event being held, you know, f ostensibly for us as queer Seattleites to be on the record as such saying no. And I remember when I got the email, I was like, oh yeah, I mean, I'll go, but it's the next day, so I really don't think they're gonna cancel it, but I'll go. All the previous years I've been doing this work in the city, and you know, even outside the city, um, it was met with kind of um, closed arms, and um, you kind of learn to grow a thick skin of not getting to be heard. Um, and so it was really important that we were visibly there, though I didn't have a lot of hopes. So we organized a, a group of local activists to go, which included Palestinian queers and Jewish queers, um, many of us who've been working together for many years in community. And we got there, it's like a conference room set up where it's sort of a large table. They were clearly pretty shell-shocked by the kind of response that they had gotten both from Dean's public letter, from Selma's open letter, from the kind of wide, I'm sure, inboxes of email they had um, of folks both opposing and supporting this event, um, which I think that they're not used to as a commission. I don't think they got get a lot of public comments, so they were very, a little bit tentative and nervous going into the discussion of the event to begin with. Usually the commission uh, facilitates their own meetings, and in this case, because of the controversy, they felt like it would be really important to have someone who wasn't a commissioner serve as the facilitator. And so the challenge I had was, you know, recognizing that, that it was going to be tense, that there were strong differences of opinion, but really wanting to create space for people to say what they had to say. I think I, I was particularly nervous because, you know, we, you know, they had heard that there is opposition to this event because it specifically you know, is connected to the oppression of Palestinian people, but I wasn't hearing a lot of Palestinian voices um, talking about this. I felt like it was really high stakes and heated for me. Um, so I read the letter um, that I'd emailed them the night before, and it was hard to do it and not tremble. Um, I'm also a queer Palestinian, and being queer and being Palestinian and being a daughter of a refugee and having a dias diasporic identity is deeply entrenched in my queer identity and it cannot be separated. So I want to start off by saying that because I think a lot of queer people of color and a lot of queer people from um, non-Western societies feel invisibilized. And when we have these conversations, we're told, we could talk about occupation, we could talk about what's happening, but we're here to serve LGBT people. So let's just focus on that. So I just really want to say, I'm here, I'm gay. I live in Seattle and I'm Palestinian. 
and I'm deeply concerned that this commission that I honor so much over the seven plus years that I've lived here has decided to partner with Stand With Us. I ask you today to be courageous and to cancel this event. And to cancel this event is not an act done solely. By canceling this event and saying we do not stand with actually the racist propaganda that's used to put on this event, you are actually standing in solidarity with so many other national and international groups that are saying we will not let our queer community be used as a ploy to cover war crimes against queer people, not just Palestinians, against queer people like me. The entire time I was giving my testimony, I was squeezing the hand of Wendy. It was a very kind of emotional, um, very intimate space. And it was very clear that the reaction was emotional and in real time, you know, you saw the commissioners, it sinking in what they had done. And I remember that um, when Selma sat down, she was sort of shaky because it was hard to like speak her truth in a place where her voice was usually not heard. Of all of my years organizing, this is the most truth-telling that I have seen happen in one of those environments. We finished our testimonies um, and the main commissioner, the head of the commission, was just like, thank you very much for coming. We just really want to thank you for coming. We're going to speak about this after the meeting is over. End of story. And so just to be clear, the plan of the commission is to go ahead with the event tomorrow night. Okay, just, I, just for people's transparency, wanted to make sure that people understood that. I have to say something. I feel like we owe you guys more of an explanation. Um, I think that it's important for us to admit that we fucked up um, accepting this event. Um, it's beyond our scope in terms of like, like I don't, I don't think most of us had opinions one way or the other, and maybe that's ignorant, but that's just the truth. Um, and I and I want to say as a commissioner, and I apologize, I don't agree with us having the event. Um, and I, I guess we're having it, uh, but I just feel like you guys came here um, and shared a lot of uh, important thoughts, all of you, and I think to just say thank you for coming just feels icky to me, but that's what needs to happen. I agree. and. I may get in trouble for saying that. I don't know. I don't care. Um, I don't want to walk out of here with any regrets. And if it was up to me, it would not happen. And I feel sick to my stomach in this moment. And I feel so naive, and I apologize for that, because I had, I had no idea of the background behind some of these issues. Um, so I am so grateful for even hearing glimpses of it, because now I can ask different questions um, because I didn't know what questions asked before. And you know, there was one particular commission, commissioner in general who, after I shared my testimony, um, was really moved. Um, and he had a tear in his eye and he looked at me and he said, I had no idea. What are the real dangers of these events? And you could see it unfolding in the reactions of the commissioners around the room is that unsuspecting, sort of un you know, informed folks with really good intentions are brought into this, right, against their will and consent, right, just like swept into this because of the way that the propaganda is presented. And so you saw that the commission had no idea that, that what they were really doing was holding a forum for a false narrative about Israel and Palestine to be told. Instead, they thought they were just having like a smoozy nice event about queerness, you know, and that's not what it was. And so you saw that recognition dawn around the table on the commissioner's faces of what did we get ourselves into? I guess I have more of a like process oriented question. Um, it was said that the event can't be canceled. I guess I, I've heard from four commissioners so far who have either raised the, the point that they didn't know a lot about this topic and and or that if they had their their way, it would be canceled. And I guess I, I'm curious <laughs> if there's an event that this commission is putting on tomorrow, why they couldn't cancel it. Well, I'm actually not a commissioner, so I'm a little bit <laughs> to the chairs. Um, and in fact, if someone made a motion, there would be a vote. And if there was a motion and a second, there would be a vote taken. Okay. A motion that we vote on canceling the event 
on the basis that we we don't know what we're doing, we're not trying to take a side. I second, I second yeah. to have a vote. <laughs> I was really surprised. Like I didn't, ex I don't know what I expected to have happen, but I think that given that it's Seattle and it was a commission that seemed pretty like in their routine of how things go, like I didn't expect that they were gonna change the wheel so much. And once that started happening, where I felt like a little shift in the gears, I was like, oh, something might actually happen. Like this actually might be, you know, like our little group of people might actually be changing something, which seemed really exciting and also very surprising. I was gripping Wendy's hand. She was brave enough to keep her eyes open and at one point she tells me, it's a majority, it's a majority, it's a majority. And I just open my eyes and I notice and see that the majority of commissioners had decided to cancel the event. They voted to cancel an official event that was supposed to happen the next day. Like business as usual got disrupted. And we were just like, whoa, this is happening. You know, this happened, this just happened. Um, and. So then we like composed ourselves and shook hands and filed our way out and then like screamed at the top of our lungs in this, you know, downtown streets of Seattle about it. All of us were really excited and barely like, you know, we're a little high on the adrenaline of like, a few people made some change, like that's so exciting. Like it does happen and it's sometimes really easy to forget doing activism that like, you know, a few people coming to say something can actually make a difference. And the event in Olympia had been moved to a smaller venue. So it wasn't quite canceled, but it was moved to a, a space that could not accommodate as many people. Um, the event in Tacoma had many organizers respond to it and that was canceled. And so it wasn't just that we canceled this event in Seattle, that we canceled it in Seattle, in Olympia, in Tacoma, like the Pacific Northwest just shut it down. And there was this moment, this beautiful moment of amazing solidarity and support that happened. And I think to me, that's what I get out of it. In addition to the victory, which was yay, you know, I mean, yes, we won, you know. I mean, that's that, I, I, you know, it was a fabulous moment. I did immediately worry about backlash. You know, I was really in the moment of winning and the excitement that we felt with each other, but I knew that, okay, if we know how the organized opposition works when we're losing, we should be a little bit afraid of how they're going to act when we're winning. This was a very significant victory, which is why the backlash was also very significant. I mean, just as it meant so much to us, it also meant a whole lot to the sponsors of this pink washing delegation. Along with the sort of public responses to what was going on, of course, there was the, the private hate mail backlash that activists received in response to their participation in this. It's some deep and hateful stuff. It's both deeply anti-Semitic. I mean, I can't tell you the number of emails I've gotten that are like, die, capo, I wish your family had perished in the death camps. I mean, that is a regular occurrence. Also, in these cases where the issues um, bring to the fore a conversation about queerness, really super homophobic and transphobic. There was a lot of media stories that um, demonized the activists who had you know, shared our perspectives, um, both live at the commission meeting and also um, a lot that criticized the letter I had written to the commission that I posted. I received a great deal of hate mail, some of which included threats of violence. Um, and I also, probably the most disturbing thing that happened was that um, someone made a collage of photos of me on Craigslist. Um, they posted it consistently. And it kept getting reported and taken down, but it kept getting reposted. And it said something like, ugly little dyke, and it had um, some kind of rape threat implied. This kind of backlash, both the really intense directed hate mail and the um, use of um, you know, things like that kind of media, are very typical of 
Zionist backlash in this context. I think one of the things that anybody who's made any public statements about um, concerned with Israel and Israeli apartheid or in solidarity with Palestinians face is, um, is a giant response. And this was kind of happening on multiple levels. The media was at a frenzy. The mayor and the city council in Seattle was at an uproar. Some of the media stories talked about me being anti-Semitic, which is particularly painful and uncomfortable because, of course, I'm Jewish and my uh, father is a Holocaust refugee. To be to be told that I'm anti-Semitic because I'm um, uh, raising concerns about a violent government is absurd, right? To me, there's no... Um, Israel and being Jewish are not the same thing, right? Like, um, Israel is government, and it is a government that does a lot of things to maintain its um, uh, its regime. And those things are not things that that are, all Jewish people are doing. They're just things that a particular government is doing. And in my opinion, Jewish people of conscience, just like everybody else, can see the violence happening in Palestine and oppose it. Seeing the kind of hate that just comes in all of the time, and particularly in moments like this. I mean, I have real compassion for what the commissioners must have been facing, um, particularly after they made their brave stand. I think they have probably never in their lives received this kind of just ugly, ugly kinds of hate mail and intimidation and scare tactics. It's a lot to take in if you're used to it, and I kind of can't imagine if you're like, sitting on a commission trying to do good for your community and and then you all of a sudden receive this really massive onslaught of just hate in your inbox. It's a lot. The point of a lot of that kind of hate mail is really to make you feel isolated and endangered um, and it, it, it works. I mean, people wrote to the dean of my law school to try to get me fired and you know that there have been academics who've been fired from their jobs for speaking out publicly about their views on Israel so it's it's scary, even if it didn't, you know, thankfully it didn't happen and I had a supportive dean, but you know, you just, this stuff, it sucks, it works, right? Like it's, it's really, it's really real threats. There was hate mail that came to Jewish Voice for Peace, for sure. We were called Nazis, which is a typical, um, typical tactic of right-wing organizations. I know Stand With Us, we saw they issued um, a statement saying that the commission discriminated against the folks who were supposed to come based on national origin. And so that was their sort of way of saying that it was an, you know, an anti-Semitic move to cancel the event. Um, they said there was pressure from outside groups as though we were not part of the community. It is so important to the state of Israel that people in the U.S. only hear one story. Um, you know, the story that they are victimized um, as a state and that they need support. And so there is so much energy put into staffing into resources in different U.S. locations to uphold that this story is the only narrative that you hear. So all the like mainstream Jewish organizations and the mainstream gay organizations sort of came together and put all this pressure on the LGBT commission and then started putting pressure on the city council to pressure the LGBT commission. So they ended up issuing an apology. They wrote, the Seattle LGBT Commission sincerely apologizes for the pain, offense, and embarrassment that we caused by canceling our scheduled event with leaders from Israel's LGBTQ community who were visiting U.S. cities. Their vote did not represent a stand for either side, but recognition that we could not facilitate a neutral space for dialogue and learning and keep the conversation focused on LGBTQ issues versus the larger issues of the Israeli-Palestinian relationship. And so what I find troubling about this is the idea that these are two separate issues and that they don't have anything to do with each other. And what's especially disturbing about that is that they heard the testimony of queer Palestinians who were clearly showing how these issues are the same issue. And that if you're going to talk about LGBT rights in Israel um, and talk about LGBT rights in Palestine, you need to talk about the occupation. There was a city council hearing that became focused on this issue. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Bruce Harrell. I'm chair of the Public Safety, Civil Rights, and Technology Committee, and I'm joined by uh, Vice Chair Michael Bryan and Council Member Gene Godden. Today is Wednesday, March 21st, 2012. We emailed with each other ahead of time and decided to meet in the lobby beforehand. And I, there was a lot of kind of like hand holding and just like, we're going to go in there and we're going to have to hear, stand with us, say horrible Zionist 
things and lies and lies about us. A lot of the people from the Jewish organization spoke as though they were speaking for the entire Jewish community. So the Jewish community was really disappointed and hurt and felt unsafe because this event got canceled. So it was really frustrating for some of us to hear that because we were clearly part of the Jewish community. The apology made by the commission last night uh, was a good first step in our estimation. Uh, but uh, as was expressed earlier, many in this community are still disappointed and we feel this very personally because we've stood side by side, the Jewish community has stood side by side with the LGBT community for so long. Outside pressure that was put on our commission, the outside group had their own political motives, and by their vote, the commission actually took a non-political event and politicized what was a cultural and civil rights exchange. And as a result, they jeopardized sensitive relationships in our city, relationships between the Jewish and the LGBT community, international exchange relationships. They embarrassed our own elected officials. And they have created tension and hurt in the very community they are charged with supporting and promoting. That a public issue and a public agency would refuse to meet with any leaders, regardless of their country, if those leaders are here to talk about civil rights is appalling. They were not part of anything political. Each of them had their own stories to tell. There was um, the mother of, she had gotten involved because her daughter was a lesbian and is a lesbian and is trying to help and give her support. Someone else mentioned uh, uh, having been the partner of a lieutenant colonel in the Israeli army and the uh, conflicts they had. These were, the, these were, they weren't part of any kind of pinkwashing that we're talking about from the Israeli government. That's a, that's a false, false thing. When folks ask, well, or claim, like this, you really made this political, or the commission really stepped out of line because here was this just lovely cross-cultural event that had nothing to do with politics, and you came in and painted it with a political brush. Um, and that's just, you know, the kind of ultimate in, in irony because this was a deeply political event fr from its outset. It was a propaganda tour, you know, emblazoned on the poster was the logo of a foreign government and was a name of a organization stand with us that only does Israel advocacy. And Israel, out of all the countries in the Middle East, is the only country in which my community, LGBT people, have their legal rights recognized and are safe, including for people from other Middle Eastern countries that can come there for sanctuary. Israel is the only place in the entire Middle East where a gay person can live safely. My marriage would be recognized in the state of Israel and I could serve in the military. Our city-sponsored Civil Rights Commission violated its own tenets and purpose by silencing the voices of other LGBT civil rights leaders when it decided on its own to cancel the, its reception with the delegation of activists from Israel. In essence, the commission discriminated against the Israeli LGBT civil rights leaders. In that one act of cancellation, the committee quashed free speech and the right to assemble, and many believe that the decision was based on the national origin of the Israeli delegation. To have people come back and be like, you know, you're just silencing our voices. And I'm like, oh, that's such a buzzword in our community for people to react really emotionally and very strongly. And people are like, no one should ever be silenced. I'm sorry, I'm sorry you weren't able to come and we didn't hear your voice. And I'm like, well, there's way more to it to that. Sometimes the charge of censorship or of blocking dialogue is a direct response to um, the fact that we're engaged as activists in a boycott of Israel, right? We're engaged in a boycott of Israeli um, um, academic institutions. Um, we're engaged in a cultural boycott, right? So we're saying to um, artists, hey, don't go play a show in Israel, right? All along the model of what was used to, in the, to engage in the boycott of South Africa during apartheid, right? It's the same strategy. A boycott strategy is not a strategy about dialogue. It's a strategy that says, guess what? It turns out that our efforts to end this situation have failed, that there is not 
um, but there's not uh, equal power, so you can't have a dialogue. You can talk to the Israeli government till you're blue in the face about how it would be nice if they stopped being an occupying power, and they're not stopping, right? You know, international courts have told them that the apartheid wall is illegal, and they've not stopped building it and expanding it, right? That kind of nothing is working, and we need to put pressure on this. Um, government that is doing this outrageous violence blatantly and publicly. And so boycott is a really appropriate strategy. So boycotting events funded by that government to promote a, you know, improper and untrue image of itself is entirely appropriate. And that's not a form of censorship, that's a form of discernment. I come offer a letter of thanks to the commission, actually. I want to just read that briefly. Um, thank you, Seattle LGBT Commission. As lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer folks and allies, we extend our deep gratitude for your decision to stand for universal justice and equality. You bravely said no to the planned pinkwashing event funded by the Israeli government and militant pro-Israel organization Stand With Us. And this letter is signed by folks like Judith Butler, Sarah Shulman, um, filmmaker Barbara Hammer, and 3,500 other people. It's not censorship when a government committee decides not to participate in an event um, in favor of creating more real opportunities for dialogue that are not violently skewed the way this one was. And I'm really grateful for the LGBT Commission and all the other local organizations that chose to refuse to host these events when they learned that what they were really about. If we want to have an inclusive cross-cultural dialogue about gay rights in the Middle East, let's schedule an event that isn't tied to hate groups, that isn't sponsored by the government through the Israeli consulate. My name is Nada Elia. I am Palestinian. My, parent, my family is from Jerusalem and Haifa. And because of that, Israel violates my human rights regardless of whether I am straight or queer. Israel is presenting itself as a gay haven, but it's a gay haven for the privileged few behind a huge wall that does not let me in into the country from which my family was expelled. We cannot have dialogue with a wall between us. Hi, my name is Eitan Isaacson. I'm Israeli. I'm, uh, I served in the Israeli military, and I believe that I'm an ally of Palestinian and Israeli LGBTQ um, communities. I support the Commission's decision to cancel the meeting with the delegation. It was an attempt to exploit the progressive nature of the city and to promote a supposedly humanistic Israel in order to draw attention away from Israel's um, human rights record. This is not about discrimination. I welcome and support individual Israelis and organizations, but not people sponsored by a government that systematically discriminates, dispossesses, and exercises violence against it, not its non-Jewish citizens and subjects. When you have a conversation um, such as this would have been, which was that you have these Israelis who are talking about the struggle for gay rights in their society, and what it does is say it's a totally normal state of affairs that the Palestinians are occupied in the West Bank are un and East Jerusalem are under siege in Gaza. The Palestinian citizens of Israel, a full 20% of the citizens there, are uh, subject to an entirely different set of laws than Jewish citizens of Israel. That these true and very clear violations of international law, violations of human rights, are happening, that those are totally normal. And upon the top of them, we can have a conversation about the day-to-day, -day, to and fro of Israeli society, and that those things are political, and that everything that happens on top of them is just civil discourse. And what that does is it normalizes uh, the relationship between oppressor Israeli government and the oppressed Palestinians and says that this is not even part of the conversation. And for us in the U.S. to allow that to go on, for us in Seattle to say we want to have a conversation about Israel that completely normalizes these very oppressive dynamics is a very dangerous thing and irresponsible thing for us to do. After the euphoria of we did it, there was this sinking feeling of, okay, so we go and we listen to these people who are apologetic about having made the right decision. I decry their action as well as that of the uh, staff of the, of the Human Services Department or Human Rights Department. I think it was a monumental failure of leadership of the staff and the leadership as well as failure of leadership of the commission itself. I'd like to begin just by apologizing um, for the pain that we caused as a commission by canceling this uh, delegation in this planned event. 
We want to apologize both to the delegates themselves as well as to the members of the Seattle community and to communities worldwide who I think were affected by this decision. It seemed to us that there was a lot of pain we were hearing from a lot of people who were upset by us hosting the event and wanted to come to that event and I think my impression was to interject other broader issues beyond uh, the scope of LGBTQ civil rights issues. Um, you know, in retrospect, perhaps it would have been not a huge deal going forward, um, but at the time it did feel like we weren't prepared to have a, a, a good facilitation process that we felt comfortable with. Thank you, by the way, for apologizing. I appreciate uh, your generosity in doing that. I should say that you did cause us pain, and it was uh, quite embarrassing to have to go and talk with the folks who, by the way, seem to be very sincere, and uh, I think you would have gained from having that conversation. It was a mistake, and I, I'm glad you recognize that. And uh, to me, at least, it's, it's, it gets at the core of what commissions are supposed to be about, which is to promote open and broad dialogue. Kind of a weird mind fuck to try to say that people protesting something are not trying to create dialogue. Propaganda is not dialogue. I have to tell uh, Julie Nelson that, you know, people do turn to you, people meaning council members and uh, commissioners and the public, to be the expert in race and social justice and to, to be able to give people the tools to deal with this, this stuff. You, you may recall that when many of you were uh, confirmed, I say some of the same things to all the, the commissions. I say, let us know when you need help. Let us know. So if you, if was, you could have gotten some sage advice from at least Councilmember Lakata, if anyone else, nothing should defeat the, um, the desire for an open dialogue, nothing. Um, so, so I think we understand that now. So, so Julie, I, you know, I will tell you that I, I don't hold you to a, a standard of, of not making any mistakes. I, I would never do that to any human being. Thank you. So, so, so and, I, and, and I would disagree with, with some comments about, I think you've been a very strong leader in many regards, but we, we, we screwed up on this one. We screwed up. And so, um, you know, I have a picture of Arit who I got a chance to meet here, so I'm gonna hold it up so the cameras could get a shot at her. So when, we, when, when they know, they're gonna, a few of them will be back here in November, by the way. So we have an opportunity to have a series of, of dialogue. It was really like seeing all the weight of the backlash really do its work successfully. And to see these commissioners who had, they had heard their constituents. They had been moved by truth being shared with them from Palestinian queer constituents. And they had acted with conscience to see them forced to apologize and in the middle of a controversy that they were unprepared for. I was in City Hall and I remember just like, all of, not just my heart, but everybody's heart was sinking as we heard the commission. I would like to say thank you to the council members who reached out to the delegation mm -hmm. and met with them. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, uh, the commission was happy to hear that, that they did meet with somebody. We, um, we did regret the decision that we made um, to shut down um, the dialogue. Matt? I just wanted to um, let the council, member know, council members know that David and I are personally taking time to meet with some of the Jewish community leaders that have been heard over this, like Zach. Um, I reached out to him today and we'll be meeting with him. So, so we, are, um, we are trying to build bridges and mend what has happened. One, um, one element of the backlash that happened was that um, LGBT organizations and HIV organizations in Seattle were pressured to sign a letter um, critiquing the LGBT Commission and calling for an audit of the Commission and for greater oversight of the Commission. So um, that letter was signed by a lot of organizations that are really important in LGBT communities in Seattle, like Lifelong AIDS Alliance, and which is you know, an essential place for, um, for services people need. The Seattle Counseling Service, which is a place where most people who are LGBT go to find um, mental health support. Um, $3 Bill Film Festival, which puts on like really essential programming um, that's a really key social and arts space for LGBT people, and, and more, right? So these organizations all co-signed this letter that um, is critical of the commission's decision and also suggests that the commission, um, you know, went, 
went like rogue, right? Like like went into this whole issue of, of Israel and Palestine when they should have just left it alone and had this great meeting with these LGBT activists. So a lot of folks in our community are not gonna be comfortable seeking services somewhere that um, decided to sign on to this letter. The letter is like creating a narrative that is completely misrepresentative of what happened. I felt very sad and I felt very betrayed that these organizations made a decision to sign on. I have friends who work in some of those organizations that were they don't necessarily agree with what the letter says and they weren't consulted, but you know, the director just signed their whole organization on, like to give the impression that like hundreds of people in Seattle who work at all these prominent organizations agree with this thing when it wasn't true. I believe that every time these kind of controversies emerge, even though they're full of a lot of really painful backlash, um, they also um, are opportunities for a lot of people to find out about um, what's going on with Palestine and, and, the, and the realities of um, Israeli apartheid and Israeli colonization of Palestine. And I think that in many ways that happened here in Seattle. There was this really lovely swell of interest and support and desire to take action on the part of queer Seattleites that I had never seen in my time here. About six months after the commission decision, um, the Seattle Gay and Lesbian Film Festival was held, and as part of that, one of the films screened was a, a film called The Invisible Men, which tells a story of three or four gay Palestinian men struggling under the homophobia of Palestinian society. Um, it is directed by an Israeli director and funded by the Israeli government. There was a very one-sided portrayal of what is queer Palestinian life like. There was no discussion of what is resistance to living under occupation like for queer Palestinians living in the West Bank. That was not a part of the, the film. We we're not totally surprised given that Three Dollar Bill Cinema was one of the signers of the letter after the commission's decision, um, but we were upset that this was happening. And what we did was to create a flyer that was about the film. We wanted to ask people questions. Do they, do they believe that this is propaganda? What we know is pinkwashing is this. Do you believe that what the film depicted, that queer Palestinians like need Israel for saving? We also went into the film and when the director answered questions at the end, we asked hard questions about the occupation so that people could hear, you know, some sort of the political context for this film. We wanted to out that that film perpetuates um, this like this horrible myth. Do you want to talk about your experience with the film? It was about an issue that I knew nothing about, so I, was, I thought it was great. And what did you learn? I learned how scary it is for gay men and in Palestine and how much fun it is in television. Another important event that happened afterwards was that two of us from Seattle, Selma and myself, um, went to the um, Queer Visions, with the Queer Visions delegation to the World Social Forum Free Palestine in Porto Alegre, Brazil. Organized by queer Palestinian organizations um, with members um, attending from various different countries and cities across the Middle East and Europe and North America. And we were invited, I think in part because the international group working on that saw what had happened in Seattle and wanted to include us in this really important conversation about um, doing this kind of activism in our local communities. And that was a really meaningful um, event for us to spend several days with other activists doing work to combat pinkwashing in their local context from several countries. We held two public panels, um, one on pinkwashing. Um, I was on that panel alongside Angela Davis, which was um, like a profound opportunity for me to get to kind of meet her and talk with her at this like nexus of queer Palestinian um, liberation. And she has been a fierce anti-apartheid activist. At the end of the World Social Forum, it was gonna be a, a general assembly. You know, it was at that location where kind of the most profound experience happened during the entire time traveling in Brazil, which was getting to go on stage and read the declaration um, that the Queer Visions organizers put together. All the other organizers and activists who've been a part of the 
Queer Visions meetings behind me, holding our banner, kind of standing alongside in solidarity. By this speech, we promote the struggle of Palestinian queer people and people fighting against peak washing as part of the broader Palestine liberation and solidarity movement in the struggle against Israeli apartheid, occupation, and colonization. Thank you. It was a powerful, powerful moment. Hearing all the cheers and all the recognition in the audience um, just reinforced how important it was for us to be there. And when Selma and I came back from the World Social Forum in Brazil, um, you know, we had spent time there with activists from Queers Against Israeli Apartheid chapters in many places, including New York, um, Toronto, and Vancouver. And we were curious about whether it would make sense to um, form a chapter here in Seattle. And so we had a report back um, about the forum and what it was like and what we learned and the other activists we worked with. And at that forum, we proposed to the local Seattle activists, does it make sense to have a chapter of this group? And people agreed that it would be a great idea. So we started um, Quaya Seattle in um, January of 2013. Part of what we've done has been mutual education, doing reading groups, studying um, the, you know, the context of pinkwashing, studying the Palestinian resistance movement, um, talking, learning from each other about our own activism. We've become connected to Palestine solidarity activists on local campuses and other local groups. We really focused on doing a lot of um, fun work for Pride. So when Pride rolled around in June in Seattle, um, we prepared materials to let people know about the pinkwashing controversy that had happened in 2012 and to kind of dispel any myths or help people have a better background. We also wanted to spread the word about the letter that the local gay organizations had signed and also working on figuring out how to build more dialogue um, with the organizations that signed the letter to try to you know, really heal that very deep wound in our local community and figure out how we can build a queer and trans community in Seattle where organizations um, will be accountable to their constituents and not be kind of pulled into the kind of pressure that I think resulted in that letter. The launching of Quaya was like in in many ways, you know, the biggest win of all from from all of this because, you know, a win is one thing. If you have a policy win, great. But the truth is it's about how do you spin that forward into greater movement building, into further campaigns, into activism that's gonna get us closer, right? Um, and so the launching of Quaya in the wake of all of the interest that got generated, as well as Dean and Selma's trip and coming back and people really wanting to be a part of moving things forward um, to me as an organizer is the ultimate story of victory even if the commission apologized and you know and said that they had been wrong in canceling and all of that there is absolutely no doubt in my mind now that if some pink delegation were to come they would look into the background the political context, what is happening. They've learned. I mean, you know, we educated them and they learned. Even if the entire membership of the commission changes, this is something that is part of the institutional memory. I'm hopeful uh, for liberation in Palestine in a way that I haven't been in my previous years of organizing, where what I really noticed was a shutdown of any, or of any conversation about Palestine liberation, or a shutdown on any conversation about occupation and U.S. role in, in occupation of Palestine. But what I've seen now is that these conversations are popping up everywhere. I mean, I do see the light at the end of the tunnel and it's getting closer every day. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind about that. I think we are making huge strides on a daily basis with small and big victories. I'm hopeful because I think that the boycott strategy is a brilliant strategy. Every single time an artist or, or a musician cancels their gig in Israel, every single time an academic association passes a resolution saying that they're going to um, respect the boycott, every time there's a battle at a grocery store or co-op about whether or not to de-shelve Israeli goods and boycott them, even when it doesn't work, it still is an explosion of information that's suddenly available about the realities of Israeli apartheid. And I truly think that anyone who learns anything about it that's remotely true cannot ignore 
So whether it's New York City's LGBT Commission having a controversial event, or whether um, people are starting to raise critical eyebrows about um, where SodaStream has its main manufacturing sites, whether it's a film festival in a major city having so much direct action against it because of the funding that it's getting from this really government, that I'm seeing these conversations happening a lot more, not just in kind of my queer alternate media spaces, but also in the Washington Post and in the New York Times. I feel like I've turned a corner in my hope around the liberation of Palestine, and I believe that a liberation is in sight and near. We have a precedent over and over again that shows us that this is the strategy that's going to work. And more and more people are rallying behind it. And that, to me, is very empowering and very hopeful. Thank you.